in his possibly his last drive for Newman Haas. Christian Fittipaldi here this weekend, and uh, he was talking a little earlier about racing, or in fact, testing this week. And we've got a, an interview in the pit lane with Adrian Fernandez. Let's hear from him now. How frustrating has this season been for your team? Uh, very, very frustrating, and it's uh, sometimes it's hard to find motivation, but, you know, I, I've been in this situation before in my career, and it hasn't been easy to get where I am, so this is just, uh, you know, another building year. We have to keep fighting with the Tasman team. It's just a great team. I have a great guys, and uh, unfortunately, we have this big problem with a lot of chassis, and when you when you qualify so far, so far in the back, you have to try everything, especially here in Detroit, to make as many moves as you can at the beginning of the race, and that's what happened. It was just not enough room to some of the corner there, and got tapped a little bit from behind. I got into the wall. Look forward to seeing you in Portland. Thank you. So another DNF for Adrian Fernandez follows on from the did not finish in Milwaukee as well. He's had a couple of accidents this year and uh, scored just nine points so far in the championship. Disappointing season for the man who took a victory last year, but that's just the way it goes. And certainly with the Lola chassis not working at what was expected, they're having a tough season this year, the Tasman team. Back to the leading group, though, and Gilles de Ferrand still in control at the moment. He can set the pace pretty much, look after his tyres, and everybody else has to follow on behind him. They're running in the dirty air as well, which could be worse for the tyres. It could mean the car slides around that little bit more, and they could be in more danger of graining their tyres. Michael Andretti's dropped back a little bit from this group now. The car not working quite so well, which is interesting to see. And uh, Frank Kitty really still pushing Roberto Moreno very, very hard. I wonder if we're about to see a bit of a drop-off in performance of the two Swift chassis. If that's the case, of course, remember, Moreno driving the same kind of car as Andretti, and that could mean that Dario Franchitti is going to start pushing even harder. Yes, he is. It's, uh, he's got to plan his moves, though. It's awfully difficult, as we talked about, to make a pass on this racetrack. But straight away here, there we can see it's quite a pronounced kink there to the left. Just before they get on the braking, there is Dario Franchetti using some different lines around uh, in the mirrors of Roberto Moreno, perhaps trying to just uh, fake him out a little bit, just uh, lull him into a false sense of security almost. Uh, through this, the fountain section of the course here, that this, this next little straight is a good place to get alongside someone if you make an extremely good exit out of turn 12 here into turn 13 under braking is a, a potential passing place but this early in the race there's really just no point in enforcing the issue certainly bide your time just look for where you perhaps hold a slight advantage over the next guy yes very early stages as you say jeremy 17 laps completed out of the 77 so we've got some 60 laps to go and uh, as Gilles de ferran looks comfortable in control of the race pruitt in second moreno in third and frank Kitty still running strongly in fourth Further back, Maurizio Gudemin under pressure from Jimmy Vassa. This is a little battle that's been going on for a while, and this is the battle for seventh position. Yeah, and, uh, and right behind them is, is uh, Brian Herter, and behind Brian Herter now is Bobby Rahold, who's also found a, a way past Mark Blundell. So Mark's lost a couple of places in the early stages, as we are on board there with Jimmy Vassa in eighth position. You can see how he's moved up from his starting position of 12. That was helped by one or two cars going out, of course. Alex Zanardi, Paul Tracy not even making the start of the race, having to withdraw with those neck, pro neck problems. So that has helped Jimmy Vassar's campaign. But remember, he's going to try and match the run of consecutive finishes, the record for that at 25, and he can do that here today as long as the car keeps running. But uh, there's a long, long way to go yet, and at the moment all he's concentrating on is this battle for seventh place with the Brazilian Maurizio Gudemin. Gudemin who suffered that remarkable accident. We talked about it in qualifying yesterday about how he had an accident just coming onto the long straight. The wheel came off the car as a result of hitting the wall, landed in, the, in one of the ponds on the inside of the park here, almost a lake on the inside, and the, the wheel just sat there floating until it was rescued by one of the police divers who are on hand to uh, respond to that sort of emergency, but it certainly caused a fair bit of mirth around the circuit as these pictures were beamed around of the police diver going to rescue this wheel from the middle of the lake. But Mauricio Gutmann in fine form, just looking there at Alonso Jr., and he is in 14th position at the moment. Of course, he had to start a long way down. He had problems in qualifying, didn't he, Jeremy? Yeah, he had a water leak on that, uh, on that car in qualifying. And also, in the morning yesterday's session, they had a turbo problem as well. They had a good, close look at the engine after taking, after changing the turbo. They did a, you know, a leak check and everything on, on all the cylinders. Everything seemed to be OK, but uh, not so. As soon as he went out for qualifying, the engine let go, or, or a water line burst. Or they thought it might be an intercooler problem. Um, but uh, whatever it is, they won't really know until they get it back to base in Reading, Pennsylvania. 
The cars are here behind. Parker Johnson is the leader of the group in the green and white car. And then it's Raul Bozell in the Brahma car in the middle of that group. Alonso Jr. trying to find a way past at the moment. And Alonso Jr. has had such a, an unlucky season so far, has had two gearbox failures in the last two races. Although, in fact, to say gearbox, it's actually been more of a clutch problem that has then turned into a gearbox problem because it's put strain into the gearbox. Hopefully, they've got that clutch problem sorted out now. But from back in 14th place, it doesn't look as though Al Unser Jr. is going to do much about scoring Penske's 100th race victory. That's what we're looking for, remember, from Penske. They're on 99 victories now after that recent run of success from Paul Tracy. But from back here, I don't think Al Unser Jr. is going to be quite able to take win number 100. Parker Johnston still leading this little gaggle of cars in 12th place. Rumours that his position within the team coming under a little bit of pressure, it has to be said. He hasn't had the sort of performances that uh, both Cool and Barry Green would like to see. That's true. Robbie Gordon certainly was slated for that drive last year. He left uh, Walker Racing at the end of last year, and uh, Robbie Gordon decided the last minute's not for him, so Parker Johnstone got that ride with Team Gould Green. So the positions after 19 laps of 77. Gilda Ferran leads from Scott Pruitt in second. Roberto Moreno having really what is his best run. He qualified in second place, remember, in Rio. That was a great performance in qualifying, but had a very incident-packed race. So Moreno going well, but this now is a battle that's opening up. Interesting to see. Michael Andretti, who was dropping back a bit, he's in fifth place, but he's coming under pressure now from the man that he battled with last week in Milwaukee. Remember those closing laps, the closing stages of the Milwaukee Oval Race saw Greg Moore in the lead, Michael Andretti closing up to him now we've got a reverse of that situation because the blue and white car of greg moore the canadian is now getting right up behind the black car of michael andretti and this sets to be a good battle not for the lead of course this is the battle for fifth position at the moment yeah we're looking back down the order there seems to be uh, a fast owned car close behind a goodyear car several several uh, you know that little mini battles as you should say down the field and uh, kind of interesting there, I think. Uh, Gilles de Ferran in the lead on Goodyear tyres. Shot Pruitt right behind him. There is uh, Roberto Moreno. Dario Franchitti actually had a look to the inside of Roberto Moreno as they came into turn one on that lap. I think that cost him a few, uh, a few car lengths. He'd fallen back behind Roberto Moreno a little bit. I fancy we'll see him closing up again before too long. Yes, we have a, a pretty good view of turn one ourselves here from the commentary box, so we can uh, see the odd little chance for them to get through. Difficult corner on which to overtake. They've just gone through it there, but more just uh, lining up on Michael Andretti, showing his car in the mirrors, and you could see there Andretti's car beginning to slide. It does look as though perhaps the good years are not lasting quite as well as the Firestones in this early part of the race. Remember, most of the Goodyear runners chose the softer compound of tyre for qualifying. They can, of course, change to the harder compound at the first round of pit stops, but they've got to get there first. They've got to hold on to position before they get to the first round of pit stops and try not to lose too many places. And that looks to be a little bit of a problem at the moment for Michael Andretti. But don't forget, up front, Gilles de Ferran is also on good years, and he also could be finding a little bit of trouble now as Scott Pruitt is right behind him on the Firestone Brahma car. There is uh, the view from a different onboard camera on Gilles de Ferran's car from the side. That's the view as he comes through turns 13 and 14. Almost coming around to complete the lap, he's got a flat-out section and a, just a kink right. And interesting, we can follow the telemetry on board provided by Honda. You can see speeds of just over 180 miles an hour as they go across the start-finish line. Through turns one and two, and then a little short straight, and then hard on the brakes again as he goes into one of the tighter right-handers in third gear. Then accelerates along through a curve left into a section that's really rather like the complex at Thruxton here. Is a right, a left, and a right as they come out of this, but it doesn't lead on to a particularly long straight. A little short shoot, and then another fairly tight right-hander in third gear, taken at around 90 miles an hour. And then, this is the fastest section of the course. Just watch the speed figures begin to build up now. Up to just about 190 miles an hour as he gets onto the brakes into the right-hander. A lot of braking force there, of course. Watch the accelerator here. Not much through the right-hander, then it begins to build, and then through the double left. They can almost make one curve of this before the slowest corner on the course, this right-hander. 
Looks to me that car is just pushing a little bit, understeering just a little bit more, having to put a lot of effort in to get, to get that car turned into the corners. And uh, he's lapping, however, very consistently. He's lapping in a low 1 minute 13 range, uh, which is you know, well off the qualifying pace. Of course, four seconds off where he qualified. 1 minute 09.052 is his best lap in qualifying. 1 minute 13.248 that time. So very, very consistent for uh, Gilles de Ferran. And... Uh, when he's lapping like that, there's not really a heck of a lot that Scott Pruitt can do about it. Pruitt has opened up a bit of a gap, at least two have opened up, uh, quite a big gap over Roberto Moreno now. The gap is up to about three seconds, and Moreno dropping back just as we saw Andretti begin to drop back. So they do seem to be struggling a little bit, at least the two Swifts are at the moment. Uh, behind Moreno still, Franchitti right behind him, and as they crossed the line last time, there was only two tenths of a second between them. So they're really battling. And Brian Herter into the pits. So that's a, an early stop. Lap number 23. We're just inside the first pit stop window, really, here at lap number 23. Interesting choice from Team Rahal to go for an early stop. Yeah, that, that's that's very interesting piece of strategy. There were a couple of people at the back of the field. Gualta Salas has been a couple of laps ago. Very interesting strategy by Team Rahal there. At this stage, they're looking that they have to make two stops. Uh, so everybody else is going to have to make a stop before too long. And if Brian Herter can get up to speed, now and get closed up, maybe he can move to the leapfrog to the front when everybody else has to come into the pits. Uh, it's, a, it's a long shot, but uh, yeah, when you're running uh, ninth as he was, he was clearly falling back from the group in front of him. Not a bad idea. Interesting, Jeremy, that the two cars that you're just talking about, Herter and Salas, they're both Goodyear cars, aren't they? And yes. I wonder if that's, a, if that's a sort of signal to us that the Goodyear, the, the tyre they used it for qualifying for the Goodyears really isn't so good in race conditions. Interesting. We just have to see how things... I think Robbie Rahal's in the pits as well, yes, isn't he? he is. There he comes. Here he is into the pits. So uh, team leader comes into the pits as well, takes on the fuel. Now, what they can do here, of course, is go onto the harder compound tyre if they feel that's the, if that's the right route. And that could be what they're doing down in the pits as Bobby Rahal comes back out once again. A very early stop from the two Team Ray Hull cars. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. The team leader to, uh, in there into the pits as well. A nice clean stop there. Back out. He's actually out ahead of, uh, of Brian. And uh, he'll be back now. Those two in 19th and 20th position. So a long way behind the leader. And uh, yes, we'll just have to wait and see how that one pans out, won't we, Ben? We will. It's uh, an intriguing race, this one, as we look at the tyre where the two... The competition between the two different tyre companies is as intense as ever, and they're so evenly matched at most of the racetracks we've seen. Goody have had the advantage on most of the ovals, we have to say. Although, for oh, and Pruitt slowed down. Pruitt has slowed right down from second place and uh, coming into the pits, but he was too slow there. That was very, very strange. He would have been going faster at that point. He'd obviously on the speed limit button coming into the pits, but it was way before he hit the speed limit button that we saw him going slowly. And Pruitt dropping, dropping down the field. What is the problem? Let's see where they're going to work. Looks as though the engine cover is about to come off. Oh, dear, what more disappointment for Scott Pruitt. He's had a bad run in the last few races. The accident at Gateway finished in ninth place in Milwaukee. And the man who at one stage was leading the championship now looks as though his chance of scoring good points here is all over. It means that Gilles de Ferran now has a 4.2 second lead over Roberto Moreno. Frustration for Scott Pruitt. Uh, he's uh, last year, you know, uh, you talked a little bit earlier on about how he mounted a strong challenge for the championship at the be beginning of the season and has done again this year. Last year, it was a rash of engine problems that took him out of contention. Very, very frustrated with Scott Pruitt by the end of last season. Of course, big gains by that team uh, over the winter, and they're certainly way, way more competitive than they were. So, uh, but bad luck again for Scott Pruitt. Join us as Gilles de Fran has decided to make an early pit stop from the race lead. He comes back out of the pits. It was an excellent stop from the Walker Racing crew. An interesting choice from Gilles de Fran to come in on lap number 28, one of the earliest to come into the pits. And that's now put Roberto Moreno into the lead. You ride on board with the Brazilian, and he leads here at Detroit. Fantastic performance from Moreno. Bits are crossed up as he comes in through the right-hander, and he's got some back markers ahead. I think one of the reasons for Gilles de Ferran's stop, I think, first of all, his tyres would perhaps pass their best, but more importantly, I think he was coming up on a knot of slower cars with three slower cars. Art Maia, Gualta Salas and uh, Hiro Matsushita who already stopped. Here comes the leaders now coming up to that, that group of cars. Dario Franchini, very, very close behind Roberto Moreno, who I think he's going to make a pit stop as well. Yes, Moreno decides to come into the pits. It means that Dario Franchitti goes into the lead, and it's the second time that he's led a PPG kart race because, of course, he led 
at Gateway, but into the pits comes Moreno, and Newman Haas making a similar decision not to get too held up behind the back markers because they don't want to lose track time, and Franchitti could lose out because of that. We wait to see whether he comes in next time round. Good stop from Roberto Moreno's pit crew. Into the pits in the background comes Al Unser Jr., and remember, he was quite a long way down the order as he comes into the pits, the only Penske in the race with Paul Tracy not even taking the start with the neck problems.